about, we're going to continue in the Gospel of Mark. We're still in chapter 13. Uh, today was the, the Great Tribulation. But I want to start, I want to share a little story about you know, my mom had an old cast iron skillet. I told y'all that I grew up in deep south Louisiana along the bayous, and, and there were swamps on one side and bayou and sugarcane fields on the other. And, and my mom cooked. She stayed at home and raised seven wild, wild kids. And, but she had this cast iron skillet. And she'd say, this pan can do it all. She'd fry chicken in it one day and bake cornbread in it the next. And, but same pan, multiple, completely different purposes. <laughs> And it all depended on what she needed and what the time was. And you know, as I was, I was praying over the message today, and, and the skillet reminds me of how God's Word often works. Like one prophecy, one message, but it can fulfill multiple purposes in different times of history. We're going to talk a bit about today about, about the dual fulfillment of words of prophecy from the Old Testament, how they apply back then, how they apply now, and how they'll be applied uh, come the time of tribulation. But it was. It was a time for me just to kind of reflect on, on my mom, I guess with, with Thanksgiving coming around. But uh, I do remember that skillet. <laughs> so, you know, God's Word is timeless. And it not only applies to His followers in the early church, but it speaks directly to us today. Now, as for that skillet, I don't know where it is, but I'm sure it's still frying up something somewhere. You know, the one thing that the Lord wanted me to talk to you today was not about fried chicken. But it's, if you stay ready, you will not have to get ready. Come on. Come on, Dustin. Are we in the end of times? We are. Every second that ticks by, we're one second closer to the end of time. And for believers, that should be good news. You see, Jesus is not giving all this information in very specific detail to scare you. He's telling you this to prepare you. So again, I will challenge you to steward the scripture wisely. Don't just take it as a novelty or a check off to read through your annual Bible reading. Take it, receive it, live it. Use it as the field training guide that it is. So if we can stand together and let's get some, some good training guide information. This is part of our anchor scripture for today. And it comes from Mark 13, 14, 19. It's the great tribulation. So let's begin to read as the body. So when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet, standing where it ought not, let the reader understand. Then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Let him who is on the housetop not go down into the house, nor enter to take anything out of the house. And let him who is in the field not go back to get his clothes. But woe to those who are pregnant and to those who are nursing babies in those days. And pray that your flight may not be in winter. For in those days there will be tribulation such as not been seen since the beginning of the creation which God created until this time, nor ever shall be. Amen. Thank you, Lord, for that word. Thank you, Lord, for that word. So I want to talk biblical prophecy and dual fulfillment. Hebrew prophecy often filled multiple purposes in, in various eras. So I want to give you an example of dual fulfillment, because I really want you to, to understand as we're reading it, particularly in, in this scripture, when we're going to go back into the book of Daniel, and, and there's some Isaiah, and we're going to go to Revelation. And, but I want you to understand and get a practical example of what dual fulfillment of prophecy looks like. So if we go to Isaiah 40, 35, uh, 3 to 5, the voice of one crying in the wilderness, <clears throat> prepare the way of the Lord, make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be exalted and every mountain and hill brought low. The crooked places shall be made straight and the rough places made smooth. The glory of the Lord shall be revealed and all flesh shall see it together for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. Now, at the time that Isaiah was given, that's the near-term application. They were talking about the return of the Jews from the uh, exile. They were exiled into Babylon. They were talking about preparing the path for the Jews to return from exile. But in the long-term fulfillment of this prophecy, we go to Matthew 3.3. 3. It is applying to John the Baptist preparing the way for Jesus. For this is he who was spoken about by the prophet Isaiah. He's referring back. John's talking about, or Matthew's writing it, but John's talking about going back to Isaiah. 
the voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. You see, Isaiah's prophecy was given 44 years before the Babylonian exile. But that's also 568 years between the events of the exile and John the Baptist. You see, Isaiah uh, the 40, 3, 5, it applies to each because God's word is eternal. And you know what? It also applies to you today. Amen. What I will tell you is that God can and will make your crooked places straight. And he will make the rough places smooth if you'll let him. So Jesus gives us clear signs to a clear end and a new beginning. Last week we talked, we were still in the, uh, and, and we're going to stay at Mark, but we're in chapter 13, 7 through 13. And he's given his disciples the signs that are going to lead towards the end of times. What's leading to the end? Like, what do we look for? What do we see? You see, they were basically regular occurrences that we have today. But what he's telling them is as the end approaches, he, he likens it to birth pains. What's going to happen is the, the frequency and the intensity is going to increase. It's almost going to get to a point where just living life is almost unbearable. So according to Jesus' prophetic instructions last week, uh, these are some of the signs that are only the beginning. These are the deceptions. I think you've got to back up one. These are the signs. When we start to see these, this is just the beginning. I know we hear about a war. We see an earthquake happen somewhere. Well, it's the end. It's the end. It's not the end. It's just the beginning. These are the beginning signs. Now, then he goes in and he talks about, then these are the birth pains. This is when we go from the beginning and things are getting a little escalated. They're getting a little elevated. There's going to be arrests that happen and beatings in, the, in their synagogues or in the churches. There's going to be fake court trials. Increased evangelism because Jesus tells us that the gospel must be taught to every nation. And I just want to, as you look at these instances, are these things happening today? Are they increasing in intensity and frequency? I will tell you that they are. But is it the end of time yet? No. But we're getting there. You see, there's got to be an urgency and a preparedness in our lives. When I tell you that, that you know, going back to my, my career as a special operations police officer and, and our SWAT motto, motto was, if not us, who? That applies to us more than it did any tactical unit anywhere. If not us, church, who? If we don't share the gospel, who? You see, we know what's coming. We know what to look for. I'm going to tell you what the sign is when you know the end is here. But there's got to be a sense of urgency. And now without preparedness, that urgency, you become a victim. But when you are prepared, when you stay ready, you won't have to waste time getting ready. So what is the sign that shows the world has entered into the end of times? Mark 13, 14 tells you. So when you see the abomination of desolations spoken of by the prophet, by Daniel the prophet, standing where it ought not, let the reader understand. Now that is not my insertion. This is the scripture. Let the reader understand, and I will explain that to you. Then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. So just for an example, let's get some geographic perspective. Judea is like the county. It would be like Ellis County. And then Jerusalem would be the city, such as Midlothian or Waxahachie or Mansfield. What he's saying is when it's time, it's time to go. There's going to be no time to get your coat or charge your iPhone or do anything. It's time to flee. You see, the abomination of desolation, it signals the end. That's it. Like, what are the other signs? No, there's no more signs. Like, this is it. This is the tribulation. So what is the abomination of desolation? Well, in the Hebrew, it talks about the detestable things of desolation. It is something devastated by sin and idolatry. It could be a person or a thing or an event, and it defiles a holy place so wickedly that it causes it to be abandoned. Like God absolutely detests it. So what are some facts that we know about the abomination of desolation? Uh, if you'll just leave that up there so we can reference this. We know, based on Scripture, it's something tangible. So how do we know that? Because Scripture says, to be seen. 
We know the prophet Daniel spoke about it. Why? Because Jesus himself referenced the prophet Daniel. What else do we know? It'll stand where it should not be. Stand is tangible. Remember in the scripture when it talks about standing in a place, it is the establishment of something physical and governmental and structural. And where is this going to stand? Where? Where it shouldn't be. So when scripture says, let the reader understand, what I want you to see is Jesus is talking to his disciples, but this was not for the disciples to see. You see, this was meant for for later generations. Us, we're the readers. They were the eyewitnesses. So when Jesus, when when the scripture says, let the reader understand, this is letting the disciples know, you are not going to see this in your lifetime. This is for us, people like us, the readers now. It was meant for later generations. And then when it's seen, it's time to escape. So just so we're clear, because the last couple of weeks we've been talking a bit about the signs leading up. How do we know? And those are the signs. Now you know. And it's not going to be hard to see because it's tangible, because it's present, because it's been identified. And you'll know it's time to flee. So when Jesus says, references the Old Testament uh, prophet uh, Daniel, the scripture that he's specifically speaking to is Daniel 9, 27. Then he shall confirm a covenant with many for one week, but in the middle of the week he shall bring an end to sacrifice and offering. And on the wing of abominations shall be the one who makes desolate, even until the consummation which is determined is poured out on the desolate. You're like, that's heavy. I'm like, yeah, that's good information. So I want to walk this out. This is another end time prophecy that has dual fulfillment. You see, when, it, when the scripture, Daniel was talking about, then he, he's talking about the Antichrist. Like, take off the mask. Like, remember we were all, when we watched Scooby Doo at the end, and he pulled the mask off. I knew it was you. I never figured it out. Uh, I'd have to have my parents explain that stuff. But what I want you to know is I don't want there to be any misunderstanding. When he's talking about he, we're talking about the Antichrist now. Okay? I want you to be super clear. He shall confirm a covenant for many, with many for one week. He is the Antichrist. He's going to make an agreement. One week in the Hebrew is Shavuah. It means a period of seven years. So when it says one week, we're talking a covenant for seven years. When it says confirm in the Hebrew, it's higbrid. It means a strong or strong enforcing. Something that's going to be like a, a Middle East peace agreement. The Antichrist is going to come in, in, in this power that's given to him, the satanic power. But he's going, to, he's going to broker this, could be a Middle East peace agreement. That's going to be very welcome. And for seven years is going to be the agreement. But it says, but in the middle of the week. So if we know that a week in the Hebrew is seven years, we know the middle is what? Three and a half years. We also know this because we go back to Daniel 12, 11. And Daniel tells us, and from that time that the daily sacrifice is taken away and the abomination of desolation is set up, there shall be 1,290 days. Now, I'm no mathematician, but I've got a calculator. And what that adds up to is three and a half years. Well, I will also, we've talked about the three schools of thought for tribulation, pre-trib, mid-trib, post-trib. This is one of the foundational scriptures when, when for the mid-trib team. Then it goes on, it says, and he shall bring an end to sacrifice and offering. The Antichrist is going to make a seven-year agreement with Israel, and he's going to break it halfway through. He's going to gain their trust. They're going to drop their guard. They're going to start rallying around man instead of clinging to God. But then he's going to break it. And see, at the time, the Jews are going to go back to the process of of sacrificing in the temple. And the Antichrist is going to stop that. And then he's going to stand up and declare himself as God. What I want you to notice when we're talking about sacrificing in the temple, Where's that final act going to take place? The act where the Antichrist, where in the scripture, standing where it ought not. Where's that location? It's in the holy place. What is the holy place? The temple. Now, as believers, we understand, we know scripture. You also know that the temple, the second temple, was destroyed in 70 AD by the Roman general Titus. 
We know this because Jesus prophesied when we, we went over that a couple weeks ago. When they left the temple, they went across the street, sat on the uh, Mount of Olives. Jesus prophesied about every stone will be knocked down. So that's from the time Jesus prophesied that. That was about 40 years later. That's 70 AD, 70 AD when the Roman general Titus literally destroyed the temple in Jerusalem. So here we got, here we got scripture that's talking about resuming sacrifice in the temple. You see, I want you, you have to understand, remember, that this is coming from a, a Hebrewic understanding, from a Jewish cultural context. Orthodox Jews, they do believe in a future Messiah. They do believe in a descendant that will come from the line of King David, that the Messiah is going to restore Israel. They're going to rebuild the temple in Jerusalem. They're going to gather all the Jews to the land of Israel and bring about an era of peace and divine justice. That kind of sounds like they're waiting on Jesus. You see, their Messiah did come. But the Jews rejected Jesus. They still reject Jesus as their Messiah. Now, unless, I will make clarification, unless they're Messianic Jew. These are the Jews that have received Christ as their Savior. What I will tell you globally today, there's 14.7 million Jews globally. Only 2.5% of those Jews are Messianic. What does that tell us? We've got a lot of opportunity. We've got a lot of opportunity to witness to Jews, to witness to Muslims. Y'all, there's a lot of work to be done. There's a lot of work to be done. Goodness gracious, there's some blessed families where everybody in the family is a believer. But it doesn't mean you get to pat the dust off your hands and sit back and enjoy Thanksgiving with a bunch of God's people. It means you've got to rally the troop. You've got to get up. You've got to get out. And you've got to find yourself some souls that, that are still facing the condemnation. There's a lot of opportunity for us. So the Jews, they may have missed the Messiah, but it doesn't mean God doesn't love them. You see, their anticipation of the Messiah, it does reflect their deep, deep longing for God's promises. What I want to tell you, an equipping moment. We are an equipping church. My job is to equip you to do the work of ministry. We are to be prepared. You see, it's easy to see. Some, a lot of people want to disparage the Jews. But you know, it's easy when you see things clearly than to judge people who don't. I'll remind you that we were once blind. We were once blind to the goodness of God, but it was by His grace that we now see. Amen. We must love and have compassion for the Jews. We must also share the gospel with them as well. You see, the Jews are still waiting for the, for the temple to be rebuilt. And you're like, well, why are they doing that? Well, I want to tell you how committed they are. There's three, there's three primary organizations that are actively, actively pursuing the rebuilding of the temple. The first is the Temple Institute. These actually exist today. They have created architectural plans. They have gathered materials. They have crafted sacred vessels and garments that are going to be used in the temple. There's the Temple Mount Faithful. They've actually constructed the cornerstone for the third temple. And they're creating some temple-related utensils. This is the level of anticipation, of expectation. You know, remember we talk about the Sanhedrin Council. They've even reconstituted the Sanhedrin Council so they can establish governance and oversee the matters of the temple. So we're not talking about people with a pie in the sky, head in the clouds type of wish and a hope. This is actively today going on. They are fully prepared to, re, to rebuild the temple. Now, there's a couple issues. There's a couple issues with rebuilding the temple. Number one, as we know, we know God no longer resides there. How do we know this? Because Matthew 27 and the Synoptic Gospels all tell the same account. And Jesus cried out again with a loud voice and yielded up his spirit. Then behold, the veil of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom, and the earth quaked and the rocks were split. You see, when that veil separated the Holy of Holies, which is the most sacred part of the temple, where God's presence was believed to dwell, what it did was it, it, it represented a new way of approaching God, no longer restricted by location or temple rituals. We also know that Scripture confirms in 1 Corinthians, and this is for you, this is for us, do you not know that you 
are the temple of God. You are the temple of God. You know, we talk about the believer's authority. Let that authority begin here, understanding and receiving that you are the temple of God. This is how special you are. You are the temple of God, and that the Spirit of God dwells in you. The sick, not even the second, the instant you receive Christ as your Savior and Lord, the Holy Spirit dwells within you. You were no longer just human. You were supernatural by the indwelling of the supernatural God. If anyone defiles the temple of God, God will destroy him. For the temple of God is holy, which, which temple you are. This is one of the issues with rebuilding a physical temple. Go a little further in 1 Corinthians 6. Or do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God, and you were not your own? So many people, right? I'm going to do what I want to do. You can do that. Or you can do it God's way. Because you are no longer your own. You have been entrusted with the indwelling of the supernatural Holy Spirit. For you were bought at a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. You see, that's some of the issues that, that they have with creating a third temple. Now, there's a, there's a bigger issue, and I'm glad that, that Lisa even alluded to the, the Muslim dilemma. You see, also the location where the sep- second temple was, uh, the proposed site of the third temple, it's actually under Muslim control. You see, it's the al Ask Mosque and the Dome of the Rock. I know you've seen these pictures. This sits in the holy city. These are two of the most significant structures located in old Jerusalem. The entire city, the entire area came under Muslim control in 637 AD when when the Muslims took it away from the Byzantine Empire. And I will tell you that they're not just going to hand it over to one of these organizations. Islam claimed this spot, which is where they say that the prophet Muhammad ascended to heaven. So these are some of the issues that that you're looking at with the reconstruction of a third temple. And it's important because the more you know, the more you know about Scripture and what's going on in the world, you can see the the, the challenge. It's not just as easy as saying, well, well, the Antichrist is just going to start, they're, they're going to start redoing sacrifices in the temple you got to go a little further. What temple? That temple. You start looking at what Scripture says. As believers, we understand that temple, that's us. We are that temple. It's important for you to know the facts. It's important for you to know Scripture. You see, the more Scripture you know, the more you're aware of the dynamics that lead to the end times. Daniel 9, 27 tells you, And he shall bring an end to sacrifice and offering, and on the wing of abominations shall be one who makes desolate. The wing of abominations in the Hebrew, it implies something vile and sacrilegious that's spreading out. It's growing and it's invading the culture like, like leaven. And I will tell you, you look at this world and you tell me if you've noticed anything that's vile and sacrilegious and is spreading across this globe. You've got to be aware of what's going on. Even the Muslim religion, it is diabolically opposed to Christianity. We're going to talk more about this next week. But the, the woke movement and all these other things, Liquid genders and, and, and multiple. Y'all, we've got to stand to the eternal word of God. There's a standard that's been set. We've got to cling to the standard. Otherwise, it will. These wing of abominations, it's going to continue to spread. We've got to hold the standard. You see, the prophecy is connected to even previous uh, verses in the book of Daniel. We'll go to Daniel eleven thirty one, And forces shall be mustered by him. This is the Antichrist. And they shall defy the sanctuary fortress. Then they shall take away the daily sacrifices and place where the abomination of uh, of desolation. You see, that was for the time. In the long-term nature of prophecy, we're also talking about about, uh, Mark 13, 14, standing where it ought not. This is moving towards the end of times. Jesus has given us very detailed information. 
You see, God's word, it's not a random collection of stories. So people, well, that's a coincidence. How he knew that was going to be three and a half years. How they knew that was going to be. God's word is your past and your present and your future. I'm just encouraging you to learn from it. I want to encourage you to, we stay in Daniel 9, 27, that God's, there's God's sovereignty in all things. And you might think, man, that sounds terrible, the desolation of abomination and, and all these things. And Daniel 9, 27 tells us, but until that time, he will continue to desecrate all that is holy, even until the consummation, which is determined, is poured out on the desolate. Now, what that's talking about, the consummation, is the destruction, the completion, or the failing of. In his timing, God will pour out his final judgment, his wrath, on his enemies, which are the desolate. And these are the signs of the end of their evil actions. When we're talking about the, the end of the consummation, the pouring out of God's wrath, this is what we're talking about in the second coming of Christ, the, when he establishes his millennial kingdom, a thousand-year reign of peace. God doesn't just take his hand off, but there's, but there's signs and there's times and there's actions that are going to occur. And God is telling us what's going to happen. God is encouraging us to be aware of what's happening. So we'll continue. So when you see the abomination of desolations, and, and then Mark 13, 15, 18 says, Let him who is on the rooftop not go down into the house, nor enter to take anything out of his house. And let him who is in the field not go back to get his clothes. But woe to those who are pregnant and to those who are nursing babies in those days. And pray that your flight may not be in winter. Like Jesus is warning the disciples that everything experienced prior to the abomination of desolation is not even going to compare to what's about to happen next. I mean, he gives literal instructions in Mark 13, 14. Flee to the mountains. Flee to the mountains. Now in those times, the mountains were where you fought war, where you fought your battles. You had an elevated position. You had a hard position. It was a good position if you're going to fight battles, if you're going to fight war. You want to be up top looking down with, with hardened conditions. This is what Jesus is talking about. You see, people have got to be ready to take swift and decisive actions to escape the horror. And I know you're like, man, this is a, this is a tough message. We got to go to lunch after this. But it's not to scare you. It's to prepare you. It's to embolden you and give you a sense of what's coming. Give you a sense of urgency. I want you to even think about people that, that you've not shared the gospel to. People that the Lord's put in your place and given you a prophetic word to give. And you're like, mm, no. What are they going to think about me? How about we stop thinking about what people are going to be thinking about us. And we start realizing the reality of what's going to happen. You see, this is another dual purpose prophecy that I want, you to, I want you to understand. It would also apply a few decades later when Jesus is talking about run to the hills. Like run to the hills. When he, Jesus prophesied that when he was sitting on the Mount of Olives, remember it was about 40 years later, uh, 70 AD, when Rome came in and they destroyed the temple. This is what Jesus was talking about in the near term. Y'all, in about 40 years, you're going to want to run to the hills. This is what he's talking about come the end of times. It's now been a couple thousand years. Still the same prophecy, still the same word, still the same calling to be prepared. You see, it's going to apply at some point in the future. And every second we pass by, we're one second closer to that moment. It's going to apply as the end times begin. And so here we are. Now I, we know that this is tribulation. When's the end time going to happen? Jesus told us. When it comes to the abomination of desolation, this is when the Antichrist establishes himself and sets himself up in the temple. This is the tribulation. This is when it begins. You see, what I want to share also is we're going to stop here today. We're going to stop at this point before we go one sentence further into the, into the Scripture. It's so important that we understand this tribulation period, that we understand the rapture, the resurrection, everything that's going to happen at this point, that I want to take next Sunday to totally devote to understanding the tribulation.
I know today was kind of dark and it was kind of, ah. Uh, but you know, a good warrior fully understands their opponent. They understand their enemy. It's important to understand what we're facing, what we're looking at, and what we're moving towards. It's important that you get such a sense of, secu- um, of, of severity that we're no longer lethargic about our faith. That we're no longer, ah, church starts at 1030, we can get there about 1045. We'll still make it in time to, to pray and go to lunch. Like we've got to be raised up yeah. as a warrior culture. Yeah. We've got to stop being so soft and tame about our faith. This is coming. If you believe the Bible, if you believe one line in Scripture, you've got to believe the whole thing. Yes. It is not a salad bar. It is not to be picked and choose what you like and discarded what you don't. These times are coming. But we know how it ends. We know how it ends. So for today, we're gonna, I'm going to stop before we go any further into tribulation. Because I do. I want to devote next Sunday to understanding the tribulation. And I want to I plant this seed. And I want you to think about this and meditate over this uh, over the next week. This comes from Mark 13, 19. Such has not been seen, uh, has not been since the beginning of creation, which God created until this time, nor ever shall be. I want you to see this scripture. I want you to understand. I'm going to give you some practical application as we wrap this up. This is Jesus talking to you. This is Jesus talking to you. Such, this time of the end of tribulation, such has not been seen since the beginning of the creation, which God created until this time. What he's telling you, to grasp the scale of what Jesus is saying, is to understand that all the worst possible tragedies since the very creation of creation combined will not compare to what's coming in scope of uh, intensity and global impact. I do, I want, you to, I want you to leave with a sense of seriousness about what we're talking about. And you know, we're locked in, we're sealed. Our salvation is good if you've received Jesus Christ as your Savior. But there's so many more that are not. And I just, it's important that we know what's happening, what's going to happen, what even our loved ones are going to experience if they've not received the grace of Jesus Christ. Just some examples. When Jesus is talking about since the creation, what's happened since creation? Well, one of the first things is the flood. Think about that. Everything on earth died except for Noah and his family and the ark's inhabitants. That's catastrophic on a global stance. Jesus said it's nothing compared to what's going to be experienced in the tribulation. Let's look at man-made disasters that we can can relate to. Both world wars combined 97 billion lives lost. Billion lives lost. Listen, does not compare to what we're going to experience in the tribulation. The Holocaust, six million Jews murdered, does not compare to what we're going to see in the tribulation. So I don't want to read through all of them, but they're on the screen. They should be on the screen. If they're not, I'll read through them. Disease disease disasters, the Black Death in the 14th century, 50 million deaths. The Spanish flu infected one-third of the world's population, 100 million deaths. And I'm not telling you this to depress you. I'm telling you this to encourage you, to inspire you, to embolden you. If you've not shared the gospel of Jesus Christ, share the gospel of Jesus Christ. What Jesus is trying to to help us to understand is all the bad things and all the time. And you ain't seen nothing yet. Church, if not us, who? If not us, who? If we don't share the gospel of Jesus Christ with the lost and dying world, who will? Is there hope? Yes. But that only hope is found in one place. And that's in Jesus. It's not your network televisions and your self-helps and everything else. The only hope that we have is in Jesus. Church, we can stand together. We can renew our minds. 
we can begin to develop a powerful prayer life. And I encourage you to stay connected to the faith community. Now I want to invite anyone that's not received Jesus Christ as their Savior and their Lord. If you've not made that decision, I encourage you to make that decision. For the body of believers, our faithful, mature body of believers, I encourage you. I encourage you. I commission you. I want to empower you. Mm. Through the baptism of the Holy Spirit. If you've not received the baptism of the Holy Spirit, I will encourage you immediately after I pray this closing benediction, I encourage you to come. Our elders will be front, prayer leaders, to receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit. If you're unsure of what that is, they will, they will instruct you. They will lead you through the baptism of the Holy Spirit. We must be empowered with the, with the spiritual power to begin to become bold, to preach the gospel message. So I want to I wanna close this out with a closing benediction. So Heavenly Father, as we depart from this time of worship, may your truth dwell richly in our hearts. Strengthen us to stand firm in faith, trusting that you are our refuge and our fortress, even in times of trial. Help us to be your hands and feet, spreading hope, love, and a light in a world yearning for your presence. Lord, remind us of your promise in Romans 8, 38, 39. For I am convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor demons, neither the present, nor the future, nor any powers, neither height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Jesus Christ our Lord. As we go forth, may, may we walk in the confidence of your unshakable love and grace. Now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift you up, lift up his consonants upon you and give you peace. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. Amen. Amen.